Hey friends, at the time of recording this, it's been about a week since I got home from the Foothills Trail through hike, and it sounds really silly, but I kind of miss it already uh, and would love to be back out there. I'm not sure when you're seeing this, it might be like a couple months after. I've probably put out some of those videos about it. But anyway, one of the most important things that I wanted to talk about and share is you know, if you've been hiking, backpacking, maybe through hiking, whatever, you've probably heard the phrase, the trail provides. Um, but what I'd like to share is kind of an alternative view of that. Instead of the trail provides, I mean, the Lord provides. Um, when I was on my through hike, every single time I had a need, it was met. And a lot of those needs are ones that I prayed for, but some of them are ones I didn't even know I had, but they were met. And I think to say all of those just things as coincidence or happenstance or, you know, give credit to a man-made walking path for all of that um, kind of steals some of the specialness of it. I know that might sound kind of weird, but, um, and I know the trail is not just the actual path you're walking on. It does refer to that community of people, but still for so many events to line up and for so many people and things to just be in that right moment at the right time. I don't know, just to say that that is the universe or, you know, just serendipity, whatever. I think that really takes away some of the value. I just wanted to tell you a couple really quick stories of that experience and ways in which the Lord totally provided on this hike or journey, whatever you want to call it. So the very first night, I have a trekking pole tent and it comes with like these ultralight aluminum stakes that are okay, like they definitely do the job. But to hold this tent up, you need to put a ton of tension on the front of it and it has this uh, guy line that pulls out at the front and you stake that down and that is the main line that holds this whole tent up. If, if that's not staked out properly, you're, you're going to be you know, waking up to your tent on your face. So um, the little stakes that came with it were good for the corners of the tent, but not for this really important part in the front. And I was having a lot of trouble staking that out, getting really frustrated. And so I walked away from the tent, just had to take a minute. And I saw a stake that had been left behind by somebody else um, who I guess camped there pretty recently. And it was made of a similar material, but it was like twice the length of the other stakes and had this perfect little hook or divot in it to hold that line. And it had just, it was perfect. And I wound up carrying that stake with me the entire time. Like every time I pitched my tent on that hike, you know, I had that stake and it was a reminder of my needs being met. The next really big one was um, in the way of fire starter. I had a different stove this time. I usually just carry one of those cheap Amazon stoves you get for like 15 bucks and you know the isobutane canister. Usually just carry that but I wanted to try something different. I had um, a wood burning stove similar to a solo stove and uh, was trying that out for the first time. So in my setup for that I had a little Altoid box like the tin of mints um, without the mints, and I put my stormproof matches, my little solid fuel tablets, I had some dryer lint, just all this stuff to, you know, start a fire, and I thought I put my lighter in there, but I did not, <laughs> and I found this out as soon as I got to my first night of camp, and I was just kicking myself about it. Um, well, a couple nights in, my matches got wet and while it didn't affect the actual fire start part of it it did affect the stem of the match and so i'd go to strike it and it would break right off it's like well i can't 
keep trying to light them and I don't have a lighter to light them with I'm just gonna keep striking and breaking and you know I've got all these little broken match pieces that are doing me no good and um, it got to a point where I had three nights left on the trail and exactly three unbroken matches so it was like all right you've got three chances don't mess this up and I got to talks away camp and I'd made a friend along the way who we were kind of leapfrogging back and forth and he had stopped at the same you know camp area as me and um, I asked him like well do you happen to have a lighter and he said yeah actually I've got an extra one here you know just bring it back whenever you need and that was fantastic I was like oh thank you Lord you know like I can definitely get dinner cooked and hot tonight and then um, he needed something else and you know we got into another conversation later on in the evening and he said you know what I've actually I've got an extra um, in my bag I didn't know I had so you can actually keep that one and that was just fantastic it was like oh, even more thank you Lord now I definitely don't have to worry about these matches um, and I could not stop expressing my gratitude to this guy I was just like you don't know what this means to me to you it's just like a little 50 cent lighter but this is such a big deal that was the second thing so there's more uh, if you're willing to keep listening so the hardest day was the fifth day doing Heartbreak Ridge and Laurel Valley and then getting part of the way up Sassafras to the chimney tops that was a lot of stairs up and down a lot of climbing and I knew like when I had planned my route I was like all right this is gonna be a really really hard day um, so it's not like I went into it mentally unprepared it, it it's cursed like a hundred percent without a doubt Laurel Valley is cursed okay because I had this terrible deja vu scenario where the last time we went when me and my husband, we went on our first backpacking trip, you know, everything was great, we're having so much fun, and then that time of the month comes two weeks early, and of course I have, like, nothing to take care of that with, because it wasn't supposed to happen, and the second we get into Laurel Valley, here we go, it's like, oh, that that's great, and then coming out of the valley, I wound up having a knee problem. I bet you can't guess what happened as soon as I got into Laurel Valley. Yes, two weeks early, and of course I have, like, just one. One thing to take care of it in my little first aid kit. And I was like, well, that's not going to last three days. And then while I'm panicking about how am I going to take care of this, my knee issues start. And so I braced the knee up, popped some ibuprofen. At the same time, like, my food was kind of running low so I'm climbing up to chimney top and I saw this guy just sitting in the middle of the trail with like his sunglasses on like he was sitting on the actual pathway with his sunglasses on staring at his phone and I was like hey how's it going and he looked at me and his mouth was like wide open and he didn't even say hello he just made this weird grunting noise and I was like okay all right you know and I just kept walking and with all of these things to worry about on top of my head, like, I never think this way, but I started thinking, like, crazy thoughts. I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's on the way to the campsite, and I'm going to have to sleep with one eye open tonight because he's going to camp right next to me, and I've got all these other issues to, to worry about. Of course, that was not the case. That was just me being super overwhelmed and making up more things to worry about. Um, but so I got into camp, and there was a couple people already there. I went over to one of the girls and I was like, hey, you know, just by chance, do you have anything that could help me out? You know, this time of the month hit me way early. I'm so unprepared. And she said, you know what? I actually do. I don't need them, but I have this feeling like maybe I should pack them just in case someone, you know, in our group needed it. She just like gave me a handful of what I needed. And she goes, you know what? Actually, here, take, take even more. And then, um some needs I didn't know I had were met like I was needing some friendship and companionship like I love going solo on journeys and you know you meet a lot of people so you're never really solo but I needed just some community 
that night after such a difficult hike and I didn't know I needed that. And so one of the couples broke out their guitar and they started singing and playing. And, you know, one girl said, hey, I brought stuff for s'mores. Anybody, you know, anybody who wants some, come and get some. And another girl's like, well, I brought stuff for s'mores too. And so it was like your picturesque, happy campfire moment. Like everybody sitting around the campfire, making s'mores, listening to songs, singing songs, laughing and telling stories. Ultimately, the one orchestrating all of that was God. Like he made sure those people would pick that night to camp there. And when I got there, you know, they would be welcoming and have exactly what I needed. That's kind of like the picture of God's loving kindness. Like he is this almighty, incredible being. And we are just like so small and, and pitiful. And we should expect nothing from this great being. And yet he gives us everything and more. And I think that's how we're called to walk and live. You know, obviously share the gospel, but don't like go around hitting people on the head with the Bible and just annoying the heck out of them and driving them further away from God. Um, <laughs> but by being a reflection or a mirror image of that picture of loving kindness, you know, these strangers should expect absolutely nothing from you and then you surprise them, you catch them off guard by giving them everything and more. It's pretty great to receive those gifts, but it definitely calls my heart to action and kind of calls me out like, all right, this is a picture right here. This is a real world example of God's loving kindness. So how are you extending that loving kindness? How are you showing that to people? That's what we're pretty much called to do, is because he loved us first, we go and we show that love to others, kind of draw people in and show them like, hey, this is what you're missing out on. Trace in my footsteps.